Welcome to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And today we're going to talk about whether or not you can trust personality typology systems. Uh, we did a podcast on the INFJ personality type in the Myers-Briggs system. And we did that because we felt that there was a need going unmet and it had amazing response. We had a ton of people. I mean, it just drove so much new traffic <laughs> to our site and to our podcast, which was great. But then we also got some discussion going on our website about whether or not personality typology systems themselves can be considered reliable, uh, whether or not, say, the Myers-Briggs system is flawed. And so we thought it was probably a good time to address whether or not personality typology systems themselves are accurate and reliable enough to entrust them with something like personal development. Because we at Personality Hacker are primarily interested in not even so much in personality types or personality psychology systems. We're primarily interested in personal development. So we wanted to take it from the perspective of not even so much whether or not they're accurate in and of themselves, but are they useful for personal development? Yeah, and I think that people probably fall into a few different categories in this. You know, you've got on the one hand, the person that's exposed to personality typology at their work, or a friend has given them a profile. Somehow they've taken a test, they've come out on some type, they kind of have a vague idea of I'm a I E N F T, you know, they kind of just, they kind of loosely understand what, what's going on here. And then you have on the complete other side are people who really deep dive into this. They kind of have hook, line, and sinker. They are immersed mm-hmm. into personality psychology and they're, they're thinking about a lot. They really love reading lots of information. Maybe they're on forums around their own type and they're really into it. And then somewhere in between, you've got a whole range of people who have varying degrees of interest and, you know, it, it really, it runs a whole spectrum of people's exposure to it. And so these people who are kind of in between the, the deep divers, we'll call them, and the casual exposured people to the Myers-Briggs system in particular, again, they run the, they run the entire range from sophisticated to not sophisticated. And oftentimes you have a lot of people that will pop up kind of in the middle. They'll have some exposure to Myers-Briggs or other personality systems and having been with it for a little bit of time, they start to poo-poo it as completely like not accurate, it's not real, it's flawed, it's a scam, it's just a way to put people in boxes. And so some of this language comes up when you've got you know people that have a, enough understanding of a system, but they don't have maybe full command of it. They make conclusions based on maybe their own personal understanding or their own usefulness levels with it, right? So... And, and like you said, we had some comments through Twitter and our blog and some other places. And one of the things we want to do is just address where is this falling, this system in its usefulness. Mm-hmm. A lot of people, I think, are confused about what it does and how it can be used. And in particular, what we're using it for here at Personality Hacker. Because I'm guessing it would surprise a lot of people at our approach to how we're using this specific typology and other frameworks and models that we use in, you know, in our personality hacker uh, community. Yeah, well, and especially since we've chosen to go, you know, and be really interested in and utilize these extremely soft sciences. I mean, soft to the point where they're pretty squishy. These are not, most social sciences are not particularly hard, but in particular, personality psychology is, it's relatively new. It's not something that has a lot of hard data behind it. There are so many questions right now that we have even about things like nature and nurture in and of themselves, much less whether or not things like personality types are nature or nurture. So there's more questions than answers. And so it feels like because there isn't a lot of, say, ones and zeros behind it, there's not a lot of hard data or, um, I mean, there's there's a lot of research, but there's not a lot of like hard science research behind it that it's really easy to see it as being, you know, BS. Or like you said, somebody who has a relative amount of familiarity with it thinking, well, I know how that works and I know what the motive is. And, you know, I think that that's all BS. And it's understandable. It, it actually makes me think of the, uh, the model in Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. When he talk, there's a model in there he talks about that when we form relationships with people, 
we initially form what's called a dependent relationship, which means that I need you and um, and and I'm going to over rely on you. And that's most of our relationships growing up start that way, like with our parents. And then over time, we start to develop more of our own personality. We start developing more of sort of our ways of seeing things as opposed to you. And then we become independent and I, and I don't need you anymore. And then as I age even more, I get to a point where I realized that we have usefulness together when we're working together in some ways and then in other ways we don't. And that's when we create an interdependent relationship, which is I'm a complete person, you're a complete person, and then when we come together, then we have some power, but we don't have to come together in order to have power. And so we we have a tendency with human relationships to go through these three stages. But I've noticed that we have a tendency to do this with anything that we're interested in as well. Any like sort of idea, I call them the ideas that we make love to. When we find a tool that is really useful for us, we tend to over rely on it. And this happens with personality types and personality psychology systems like crazy. Like maybe it's the first time you've read a description of yourself that makes sense, or it's the first time you felt truly understood, or it's a way for you to understand relationships. Like, oh my gosh, I'm this type and my parents are this type and that's why we feel this way. So we get this sort of this really eager, um, very, you know, we just get really excited about it. And so we over rely on it. And then we're super in the dependent phase. And, and then over time, we realize that you know, maybe it's failed us a couple of occasions, maybe the typology system isn't complete, or we have, you know, misunderstood a component to it. And then suddenly we get a bad taste in our mouth and now we're independent of it. And then over time, uh, when we've, you know, created this independent relationship from it, maybe it comes back and resurfaces and we start to realize that it might be useful in some contexts, but in other contexts it's not. And then we create an interdependent relationship with this system. And I think a lot of people stay in sort of the dependent phase or in the independent phase, which is that they over rely on on a personality psychology system and that's all that they'll see the world through. Or they're in the independent phase where they only see its limitations and they don't really think of it as being valid anymore. I've heard a lot of people go, oh, well, I don't use that anymore. I think the healthiest place to be, though, with any model or system is the interdependent phase, which is I'm going to use it when it's useful and then I'm not when it's not useful, (laughs) right? Like you don't have to, it doesn't have to be something you rely on constantly, but when it's useful, you can bring it in as a tool to be utilized in that situation. And so for Personality Hacker, we have, I would say, probably like three primary models that we work with. We primarily use the Myers-Briggs system um, and our take on the Myers-Briggs system, which we call the Genius System. We use the Enneagram, and then we use a vertical model, which is called the Graves model. And I would say that those three are sort of the backbone of all all the personality type articles we write and the blog posts and the products we make and the programs we make, etc. And all three of them have limited application. All three of them are super useful when used in context. And then when they stop being useful, we tell all of our students, stop using them. If you are attempting to use this tool in a context in which it is not appropriate, then it will it will end up becoming a weapon in your hand. You won't be able to use it for a building. So we have kind of this sort of loose grip with personality psychology, even even in a company called Personality Hacker, right? Like our whole stated mission is to use personality psychology tools in order to increase people's happiness. And one of the first things we say is don't hold on to it too tightly. Don't think that this is something that you have to apply in all situations, that this is your first point of entry. This is a tool that can be utilized in some situations and when it can't be utilized, throw it out. Yeah, I I personally have no interest in understanding the system for the sake of itself. And I think that's kind of the position the company has is we want to see these things being used for personal growth. So personal growth is the actual thing that personality hackers after. We want to see ourselves because we hopefully are growing as people and the people that we surround ourselves with in the community at personality hacker growing as well. And so any tool that will enable that to be the case, any tool that will enable growth is something that we will look at, we will dive deep into, and we'll find application for around. Because the end game is to grow as people, not just to understand systems for the sake of them. There's there's tons of resource out there, everywhere. If you just want to understand, for example, the let's just take the Myers-Briggs system. If you want to understand that, there is 
amazing resource out yeah, there. Yeah, there's like millions I mean, and millions and millions of websites, it seems. It's a great it's a great tool, a great system. And if you just want to understand the system for itself, there's great training, there's great resources, there's a lot of articles, there's books published on it. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, and I'm sure if you're listening and you've been through some of this, you, you know what we're talking about. Some of these books that you can go and access and they're they're great reads. Oh, yeah. Well, if you're, if you're just wanting to know the system... I would say that, of course, the seminal work is Isabel Briggs Meyer's book, uh, a book called "Please," Un- I mean, excuse me, "Gifts Differing." "Gifts Differing" is a great first entry point, and then if you want a really solid deep dive, there's a book by a writer named Lenore Thompson, uh, and the book is called "Your Pers- uh, Excuse Me Personality Types: An Owner's Manual." That's a fantastic book as a deep dive, and then if you want to know what sort of the cutting edge technology is in research on Myers-Briggs, I would recommend anything by Dario Nardi, but in particular his book, um, I can't remember, I think it's called The Neuroscience of Personality. That's a fantastic book and he's awesome. I mean, Dar- anything that Dario Nardi is touching right now is just, I mean, really cool stuff for bringing, you know, a lot of this out of the super squishy soft sciences into something a little harder with a little bit more what would be considered traditional credibility. Yeah, I mean, Nardi's doing research right now where yeah. he's hooking brain scan machines to people yeah. and he's, he's EEGs. Yeah. EEGs. He's trying to identify uh, basically at the brain level, like right. being able to see your brain firing and look at different personality types and how their brains are firing. Yeah, how they're wired, what happens when they're using these different functions and mental processes, and it's really cool stuff. So if you just want to know the system, there's tons of resources out there. Um, there's some really good resources. And and that's all really interesting to us, obviously, because we've read all those resources. We incorporate them into you know what we do. But that's that's not the end game for us. The end game is not these systems. The end game is happiness, right? Becoming better versions of ourselves, uh, using what we know about ourselves to give ourselves permission to get to the next level. So because we're using it in the context of personal development, then when somebody brings up this concept of whether or not these systems are flawed, it almost doesn't matter, <laughs> right? Like It's like, yeah, okay. Are they useful, right? Like, and by flawed, I guess one of the reasons why I don't really want to go down that conversational sort of tunnel too far. Like, I don't really, I don't really enjoy going down the road of whether or not it's like proven or whether or not it's really, you know, being validated. Yeah, or being embraced by psychiatrists and psychologists, or whether or not it's considered like the, you know, the the concept du jour, or if it's like out of fad or whatever. Like, none of that's interesting to me. And whether or not it's flawed in the system, like like somebody brought up recently, like it's by nature dichotomous. And since it's giving you either or scenarios and everything is an either or, well, you know, that makes it automatically flawed. And it's like, well, yeah, but you don't have to go that direction. And it's really powerful if you don't. And and there's lots of cool stuff if you don't go down, down that direction. But holding it loosely means that you aren't too married to how it's happening. And if a person goes, well, you know, it's, it's a really flawed system. If it's not useful for them, then I'll agree with them. I'll say it's not flawed. It's a flawed system, and it's not useful for them. And what is the personal development tool that would be awesomely useful for you? Yeah. Because we don't want to hold on to anything too tightly. If these systems are stumbling blocks, if they're stopping you from growing as a person or from achieving happiness, throw them away. It's not like the system itself is sacred or holy yeah. or amazing. Like it's a useful system if it's useful. I think I completely agree with what you're saying. And I think that's the that's the frame for any model. You might hear us talk, you know, we're going to, as we continue podcasting, we're going to continue to bring frameworks and models to the table. Some are going to resonate with you greatly. Some are going to be like, wow, that I just, I don't, I don't resonate with that at all. And pick the ones that work for you. Yeah. And the whole point is to take tools. It's like having a big toolbox, and for every job, there's a different tool that's needed. You don't always use a hammer at every job you show up to that's you know a physical building type job. You don't always use a screwdriver. Sometimes you use a mix of tools. Sometimes you use one tool. Sometimes you use five tools. It doesn't matter. It's each job, each context is different, and the tools you use are going to be different for that context. Myers-Briggs might work great for you for personal growth. And then come into your relationship with your spouse or your lover and it just falls apart. Maybe they don't like it. it fe- they feel like they're put in a box. So abandon it. Go to some other different tact and use what works to bring happiness to your life. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's all about sort of gaining awareness and understanding and accepting yourself more and more and then being able to see how you could get to the next level. 
And there's lots of different ways to do that. Um, one of my favorite books is Tony Robbins' Awaken the Giant Within. I one time went through with, I just had a piece of paper and a pencil and I went through the entire book and I wrote down every model that he used, right? Every single one. And there had to have been, I don't know, 25 to 30 models. Now, when I say 20, you know, when I use the phrase model, I mean, it's a representation of how reality works put in a pattern so that if you you know, if you've referenced this model, then you can basically come into the world with more power, understanding, awareness. You know, a, a model is something that's very powerful. It's a re representation of reality and it helps create predictable patterns. And so models are a big part of what we do. 25 models in a single book is a crap ton. Most books have like one model. In fact, one of my, one of, another one of my favorite books is the book um, Tribal Leadership by Dave Logan. One model. It's a. It's not a small book, right? It's like a normal size book, and he he extrapolates on that one model the entire book, and Awaken the Giant Within has twenty five. Yeah. <laughs> so that's like a crap ton, and no personality types are represented in his book. I would say that if you wanted to have a powerful person personal development tool at your system or at your side, right, a system you can reference, buy that book. Right? Like if you go through that book and really, really, really like do everything that Robbins recommends in that book, you will have a higher quality of life. Not a single personality psychology model is mentioned in the entire thing. So I think that people can do personal development without personality types. They can do it without personal psychology models. I believe that. I just personally have found that it has been such a streamlined way for me to get to a point where I'm completely, like I feel understood, I understand myself, I feel like I can sort of see where my personality is working with me and kind of working against me. I can really see all these different things that I just haven't been able to see through any other lens. So for me, it's been my jet airplane across the United States. Um, Joel and I have this illustration we reference a lot, uh, which is, you know, you can walk across the United States or you can take a jet plane across and you're gonna get across you know, either way, but one is just going to be much faster. So for me personally, personality psychology models have been my jet plane across the United States. I've gotten, I've done such, like way more accelerated personal development looking through this lens. And I know a lot of other people who have too. So that makes it useful, right? Like it's a jet airplane for me. Now for another person, if the ticket isn't working, if they can't get on the plane, if for some reason there's like some sort of scramble for them, then they can take another avenue across, right? Like however it is that you need, whatever you need to use to get to your highest level of development, to get to your greatest potential, to get to your sense of happiness, that's, that's the point. That's really fundamentally what we're all about. Yeah, and I think, you know, look at just the last podcast we did. We did it on a personality type, the INFJ personality type, who's one of the most misunderstood personality types, in my opinion. And we got some of the most response we've ever gotten on the podcast so far, up to this time of recording. People were coming and saying, thank you for uh, giving me some perspective. Thank you for explaining this. I feel understood. I feel like you guys kind of kind of unraveled some things about my personality or the person I love who's an INFJ's personality and people are finding it useful like like just that podcast alone for 40 minutes people found useful in their lives if this is something that they've been dealing with so I you know again I say that we use models that are useful and this is one that we've found for personal growth to be extremely high level and and useful as a model. Yeah. This this is going to sound like an, an apologist podcast. <laughs> Probably. Like, <laughs> like, in the classical definition in, of apology. Like. Exactly. Yeah. We're, we're basically explaining why we've chosen to do what we've chosen. But I think one thing that this also brings up for me is, and I, and I think it's important to address this, whenever you are attaching yourself to any sort of perspective or paradigm or way of engaging with reality... It's important to remember that these models and systems that we all create, by the way, what, I, um, we have a, a course called the Profiler Training Course, the Profiler Training Certification Course. It's our major deep dive course. It's a, it's a time investment. It's a money investment. We've had about 55 people go through it. And it's, it's, it's sort of our big behemoth, but awesomely deep dive program. And one of the very first things that I do in the Profiler Training Course 
which is effectively meant to get people to the place where we're at when we're profiling others and know what their personality type is, the construction of their personality type, being able to use it in coaching and that sort of thing. The first question that I ask or the first exercise that I do is I ask people, how are you already profiling? Right? Like what are the criteria you're already using to judge a book by its cover? And then I say, what do you think everybody else is using? Like, what are the top five things that you're using to judge other people? And what do you think everybody, how everybody else is judging? It's really interesting. This is just a little bit of a tangent. It's really interesting to see people's response to both of those. Because when they describe their own profiling system, it's usually things like, you know, how kind somebody is and, you know, sort of the (laughs) interactive nature. And then when you say, what do you think everybody else is using? They're saying things like, you know, the car you're driving. The gender. (laughs) Right. Like, we all assume that we're really deep in our profiling systems, our personal profiling systems, or judgment systems. And we always assume everybody else is like a shallow bastard (laughs) and only judging people on, like, how much money they have and their socioeconomical, you know, status. But that said... What's really interesting about that is we we all can't help but use typology systems. We can't help it. There is way, way, way too much information in the world to be able to process it all. And so our brains have to categorize. They have to, right? There's just too much information. If our brains didn't have the capacity to categorize, we would not be able to walk into a room and know that this was our room. Like we wouldn't be able to do that because there's just way too much sensory information coming at us. It's massive overload. So our brains have gotten really good at creating compartments, categorizations, finding little patterns, figuring out like, oh, that pencil's out of place, right? Like it's not supposed to go there. It's supposed to go in the drawer. Yeah. If we didn't have this capacity to categorize things, model reality, we wouldn't be able to know that the pencil was, you know, was out of place and needed to be put back in the drawer. It would just, it would be overwhelming. So we all naturally do this. We have to. We've gotten better and better, though, at finding predictable patterns and predictable models, which is great. But because we've gotten so good at it, one of the things we have forgotten is that no matter how good we are at categorization, no matter how good we are at profiling or modeling or creating maps of reality, no matter how good we are at it, they are just representations they are not the thing itself. There's, um, there's a really fantastic quote. It's one of my favorite quotes uh, from the semanticist Al- Al- um, Alfred Korzybski. He said, the map is not the territory. And what he meant by that is it doesn't matter how good your map is. It doesn't matter like how detailed it is and how accurately depicting reality it is. It doesn't matter. It will never actually be the terrain that you walk in, right? Like walking on top of the map will not actually get you from point A to point B. You will still be in point A, right? The map is not the territory. So to remember that the map is not the territory is to remember that no model, no system, no, you know, no pattern recognition, none of that will ever actually be the thing that you directly experience. So yeah, there's, there's some pattern recognition that's better than others. There are some maps and models that are better than others, right? Like, and, and we gravitate towards the ones that are more or less, you know, more accurate dis- depictions of reality. But they will never actually be the thing itself. Mm-hmm. So their accuracy will always be in question. And that's why we say don't hold too tightly to them. Yeah. You know, like don't hold on too tight because it's still just a map. It's still just a model. And in fact, we were talking about it before. When when we put language to things, we're entering the world with a bias. Oh, yeah. We use the English language. So as soon as we start speaking in English, we've already biased ourselves to the very language we were given growing up. Like we're using words that we were we were taught and people that speak other languages might think about things differently by the fact that they use a different language to think about those things. Right. <laughs> that seems kind of heady, but that's that's kind of what's happening when yeah. we show up at the table. Yeah, the language that we are raised with actually alters how our brains are programmed and learn to program themselves. Like, they alter how we're wired. The language does. When you look at the wiring of an English speaker or Western speaker versus um, an Eastern language speaker, the wiring is actually slightly different. Like, the whole way of going about reality is different. And the only way, again, to, you know, the whole map is not the territory. The only way to actually be in reality, 
quote unquote, right, is to directly experience something without bias. As in like, I am directly experiencing this thing and I, I'm bringing with me absolutely no thoughts and no feelings. I am just completely in receptivity mode. That's the only way to engage with reality in any sort of, ac- you know, with any sort of accuracy. The second you bring a thought to the situation, the second you bring a feeling, you are biasing how you're interacting with the thing and you are, you're muddying its accuracy. Well, and by definition, you're bringing some type of model. Language is a model to see and experience and talk about reality that we see together, to co-create reality together through language. So we're using a model and I don't see a lot of people going around trying to do, uh, invalidate that model, right. you know, they might do it for personality, but they don't do it for the, the other models they use, the yeah. language they're using to invalidate another model. They're not trying to invalidate. So um, I, I can kind of see how this keeps going back level by level by level as you start invalidating models. Well, yeah, they all are kind of useful yeah. or not useful, but all of them are just representations. Even the language you're using, right. even the language we're using to talk about those being representations is a representation of itself. Like it's a it's a res- representative model mm-hmm. of reality on us describing. Otherwise, we couldn't communicate it to you because it can't be yeah. directly communicated. Right, yeah. I mean, unless we were able to sort of like transfer pictures from one person's brain to the other, right? Like until we get to that level of communication sophistication, and even that, the pictures in our head carry bias. <laughs> well, the, the framing of the picture would be a bias. <laughs> right, and so we're always going to be interacting with reality on some level of inaccuracy. We always are. That's just that's just how it is, right? My favorite writer of all time is Robert Anton Wilson, and I'm sure I've quoted this in a previous podcast, but he said, the easiest way to be brainwashed is to be born, which means that we enter the world ready for people to download a bunch of biases into our brains. And that's just how we engage with reality. So any argument about whether or not something is you know, more or less accurate. It, it's almost, I mean, and of course we just way zoomed out. Like we would, we went up to the 20,000 foot level big time on that one to talk about sort of like the error rate of all things. Right. And, and that's the perspective we're coming from because, you know, you keep peeling the onion layers back and eventually get to a point where it's like, oh, okay. So actually all of this is relative to the situation, the context, it's all kind of meaningless until we put meaning into it. And the only way to actually know reality is to directly experience it without bias. And so as soon as I start talking, I'm now no longer directly experiencing reality. Um, And by the way, these concepts can be more elegantly fleshed out in books like The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Um, and, and he's, he's a great resource for this. Um, so is David R. Hawkins and a couple, you know, a couple other people who kind of have their finger on the pulse of what could be called the unity mind or sort of, you know, the, these higher levels of sort of transcendent thought about the nature of reality. And you may or may not buy that. You might think that that's all bullshit too. And that's fine too, right? But that's why we don't hold on to anything too tightly is because it's, it really is a matter of what's working for you. And Anytime you get into a truth versus truth argument, I kind of feel like both sides have lost, right? Like my truth is better than your truth and my truth is more important than your truth and my model is more important than your model or look at how invalid your model is and look at how awesome my model is. I just kind of feel like like that's not really helping create win-wins because both models probably have some level of validity and both models have some level of, you know, Ridicu- errors. Yeah, errors and ridiculousness about them. So the question is, which one is working for you? Wh- which one is getting you to a higher level of yourself, a better version of who you are, so that you can bring, no matter what the model is, whatever gifts you have, to be able to focus on the really big challenges the world is experiencing? What gets you to a place where you are the best version of yourself and you are in such emotional and psychological abundance that now you have enough to give back. Now you're in a space where it doesn't take from you to help solve the world's challenges. It's not extra burden on you to be able to give to the world in big ways. Whatever is getting you to that point, that's a good one. Yeah. So we we zoomed way out. Let's let's zoom back in again, uh, back down to talking about the Myers-Briggs system and our our take on it, the genius system. 
and why you know i guess you you mentioned the word an apologetic earlier and so let's let's keep going down that road <laughs> let's let's just kind of go ahead and embrace the fact this may be an apologetic podcast which is cool and again if you if the word apology is tripping you up uh, we're actually using the classical definition of apologetic and when i say the classical definition of an apologetic I mean, we're not apologizing because we're sorry for something. We're explaining a position. It's a position of stance or it's a position of why we choose to use or think or believe something. So that's kind of the, the way I'm using the word apologetic. So if you know at the cognitive level how your mind makes decisions and how it learns new information, well, now you can make better decisions because you know the way your mind works or you know how it learns information. So you can learn information faster or you can deep dive, or you can make pattern connections, like we were talking about with intuition. If you use intuition as your learning style, you're able to use it to its fullest potential and use it in a way that will increase your happiness through personal growth in your personality. Right. And I've noticed that when people do this for themselves, like they learn, say, the systems that we use, and they understand how they're learning new information, and they're making decisions, and they're optimizing these mental processes for themselves. It, the ability to give grace to others for the differences massively opens up. They give themselves permission and then now they're giving everybody else permission to be different from them as opposed to insisting that everybody see the world the way they do because they understand that this is not about you know, like sort of cognitive preference as in like, or excuse me, conscious preference. They don't see it anymore as like, like I'm choosing to believe this thing or I'm choosing not to believe this thing. They're, they're recognizing that's actually just wiring. That wasn't really a choice. It's just sort of how you came out of the package, right? And so they give themselves grace, they give everybody else grace. And now we, you know, now we're way further along in being able to communicate with each other and and be able to create these win-wins. So I, I think that with the systems that we're using and highlighting the ability to grow through them, not just master the system itself, but actually be use, you know, being able to use it for your own personal development and to be able to use it to help other people grow, maybe through a coaching practice or whatever. I think that that's something that is a major massive win regardless of whether or not you know it's the it's the darling of whatever is the current you know um sociological or psychological you know uh academia preference and so one of the major ways that we've just kind of chosen to bypass all of that is by teaching people the system through profiler training uh profiler training is massively beneficial for really doing that major deep dive. So, you know, we, we've we created programs to make sure, and the owner's manual as well, profiler training, that's a massive deep dive. That's to go way, way down the, the rabbit's hole of learning the system in completion. But then we've got this program called, you know, Your Personality, um, the owner's manual, which is about making sure that you as an individual understand your personality in totality in order to eventually you know, bring your talents to the world. So that's really been the focus the whole time for us is using this understanding to create programs, platforms, the, the podcast, right? Free, paid, whatever, however, you know, the person chooses to enter. We've got lots of great, you know, free material and we've got lots of great paid material. And it's regardless of where you're at, that's the point. The point is to make sure that we get this message out to people to make sure that they're utilizing what we think is a very strong tool in order to create their own personal sense of satisfaction, happiness, and then bring these, you know, bring these gifts to the world. Yeah, I, I remember, I mean, one of our students that came through Profiler Training, for example, because he, he wanted to potentially hire our company to come in and profile some of his employees, help the team, you know, work together and stuff. And he decided he was just going to take the profiler training to be able to do that himself. So sit down with somebody and, you know, ask some questions and find out their personality type. And one of the one of the things that came out of this was not only was he able to use it in his business, but then he actually was able to understand his relationship with his son a little bit better because of the abilities that he had gotten through trying to do something for his business. And he didn't even, that wasn't even a benefit he was looking for by using this system. And here it's it's not only helping in his business and team, you know, arrangement, but now it's helping his personal life and his his family and more understanding is created among him and his son. 
Yeah. Well, and actually his father, too. It was like three generations. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Because <laughs> his, his father had actually started the business. Yeah. And it drove him crazy how his father chose to, you know, go about the business. And so he was actually able to reconcile his relationship with his dad a little bit more and then also reconcile his relationship with his son. So it was like the like you're right. He took it for business, but it actually ended up really benefiting his personal life as well. And if it didn't work as a tool, get rid of it. But it did work for him in this. And it's worked for lots of people that we have worked with, um, you know, the consulting we've done for companies like Zappos and all that. It's, it, it's worked for these companies. It's worked for people. We feel it's a great tool. It is not the territory. It is just a map, but it's a great tool that we believe is extremely useful in uh, all the benefits it brings. Yeah, so that's sort of our take. So this was our single apologist podcast. <laughs> we felt like it was needed. We had yeah. a, lot of, a lot of questions. A lot, we, and we did. Thought, Let's just do a podcast and answer some of these. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, regardless of whether or not, you know, you're you're listening to us because you like the personality psychology angle, maybe you just like the intuitive conversation that we bring to the podcast because we've got lots of podcasts that have nothing to do with personality types. But that's really the focus that we want. We want people to feel like this is a place where if the, that's the direction they're headed, if they want to become better versions of themselves, if they want to get that piece, that missing piece, that that part of them that wants to make an impact in the world. And maybe they just need a little cheerleading or maybe they just need a support system or maybe they just need somebody to kind of, you know, f- help them feel more understood. Then that's really what we want to bring to the world. So, you know, accept personality psychology, throw it away, whatever makes sense to you, but be the best version of yourself and go out and make the world better if at all possible. Absolutely. Subscribe to this podcast. We want you to be with us every week. So please go over to iTunes or if you're on an Android device or the Android platform, uh, subscribe however you do that there. I don't have an Android, so I don't even know how it works, but I know (laughs) iTunes and how that works. So go subscribe to us. We'd love to be, you know, part of your your, uh, weekly life and be part of your experience. And we'd love to have you part of that. Also, we have a growing community, continually growing community over at the facebook.com forward slash personality hacker page where like minds, just like you are gathering, we're talking about personal growth and personal development issues. We're talking about some personality psychology issues. Uh, We are, you know, that community is supportive and growing and we're interested in helping create happiness. And so that's a great place to kind of come and get a a taste of what the community is like, be a part of us. Also, twitter.com forward slash personality hack is another place that you can join in the discussion. So, um, and of course, our website, personalityhacker.com. Yeah, we've got some great comments going on right now at the website. So please feel free to leave a comment there. I was going to mention one thing before we ended. And that is now that we've been an apologist the entire podcast for personality types and, you know, throw them out if you don't like them. For those of you who are into it, though, we have gotten a lot of requests since we did the podcast on INFJs or Perspectives Harmony in our system. Since we did that podcast, we got a ton of people who were like, ooh, do me, do me. <laughs> Right, like they want all the 16 Myers Briggs types to be represented in a podcast. Well, we've got a podcast schedule that makes that not particularly, you know, um, a, a possibility right now. But what we decided to do is we're going to do shorter podcasts on each of these personality types. And we really recommend that, you know, if you're into it, please subscribe because we won't be we won't be basically sending them out like our weekly podcast. We do an email for that. We, you know, post it on Facebook. We put it out to all the social media channels to let you know that the the podcast is available. The shorter ones, though, with the 16 types, we're probably going to not do that. We're not going to push as heavy. So please subscribe because then you'll be able to get access to all these individual types and sort of our take on them and what we believe are sort of the highest leverage pieces of information for each of these types. And subscribe to it so that you get a notification as these are being pushed out. Yeah. So you can do that over at iTunes or on the Android platform if you know how to do that. (laughs) That'd be great. So this has been the Personality Hacker Podcast for this week. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we will talk to you on the next episode.